I have a good face for radio. The public part of this is audio though, isn't it? Now this feels like a really bad job interview. <laughs> so what do you bring to the team? Bad plans and rants. <laughs> Actually, just a glass of coke. <laughs> right, okay, let's go. Welcome to Troublesome Terps, the podcast about topics that keep interpreters up at night. Um, we have a, I'm going to say it, uh, first of all, we have a very special configuration today because first of all, uh, Alex G is not joining us. Um, I think he's toiling away in some booth in Munich or in the vicinity of Munich. But we have uh, Jonathan back on the panel. Jonathan Downey from Edinburgh. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm actually coming to you from the west of the country today. I'm, I'm taking a few moments out of my holiday to record a, a Troublesome Terps episode. And when I heard who the guest was, I knew it was an episode that I really didn't want to miss. <laughs> do you want to tell us who the guest is or should I? You can do that. <laughs> yes, we have uh, a very special guest. Andy Gillies is with us tonight. Welcome to the show, Andy. How are you? Hi, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> I'm very well. Yeah, we've been looking forward to this for a while, to be, to be perfectly honest. And uh, although we had a few sort of logistical problems tonight, we have managed to find a room and we have an internet connection going and the recording is going. So everything should be fine. Um, and the topic that we had in mind for uh, tonight is actually training, teaching in interpreting and uh, that's obviously why we thought that you would be a good person to talk to because you're probably one of the one of the persons best known or always sort of connected to training and, and teaching in, in the profession and certainly within um, AIC. But um, maybe we start sort of chronologically and you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, interpreting, Andy. I think you didn't, you didn't go straight into interpreting, but languages nonetheless. No, largely by accident. Um, I mean, I... I I, I did a, a very traditional um, monolingual sort of entry into languages. I did A-levels in French and German, and I'd done a bit of Latin and a bit of Spanish, and then I studied French and German. Um, but I actually started off, uh, my first paid work was as an English teacher, English as a foreign language, which I did in um, uh, in Poland and Germany and London. Um for a couple of years and actually the interpreting or the studying interpreting was completely by chance my german girlfriend at the time uh -huh. wanted to go and spend a year in the uk yeah and so i wanted to go back to the uk with her and then it was a question of what could i do in the uk so it was either continue to teach english as a foreign language for example in brighton where there are endless language schools um, study for something like an MA or a diploma in English, teaching English as a foreign language, mm -hmm. or do something else. And um, one of the very few other things I was qualified to do was the translation and interpreting diploma at uh, Bath University. So um, uh, I, I went for that uh, instead, knowing, I mean, precious little about interpreting or translation at the time. But I mean, it's it's interesting that you got into. I mean, this this was before sort of the the dark age of foreign language learning in the UK, because that's something that is often decried these days. You know, is that the UK is not very good when it comes to teaching their children foreign languages. I don't think the UK was ever very good, even before the dark ages. I mean, yeah. even when I started, which was a long time, I mean, it was the mid nineties. Uh, the English booth, even then, had an advantage in that you could get into. The, you could get work in the European institutions in the English booth with just two passive languages. So I started with French and German. And that was already exceptional in that if you wanted to start in the German booth or the French booth, you were more likely to have to have three passive languages. Not always, but even then there was an advantage, if you like inverted commas, to being an English native speaker with foreign languages because there weren't so many of us. Yeah. And you you just knew that your talent was really in foreign languages, or your your keen interest was in foreign languages, or yeah. I mean, um, I think at sixteen in the UK, you have to take big decisions about what you study because you only do three A levels. And for me, the options were maths, physics, and chemistry, or French, German, and something else. And it's uh, an easy decision, at least for me. I, I was <laughs> I, I was uh, I was perceptive enough to realise that one path led towards lots of work, lots yeah. of study, and that another path led to um, 
going on holiday and calling it study trip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what I did. And, and it, it turned out, it turned out very well. I mean, I don't think I was ever perceptive enough to realize in inverted commas that this was a talent or this was where I should go or it's my vocation. Yeah. But I knew I liked living abroad. And that's I think fair enough. probably after my first year in Germany, it became clear that I was slightly better at speaking German than most people might be. And that perhaps I should either go back and do something in Germany, benefiting from the fact that I was a native English speaker, yeah. or try and use the German elsewhere. But I, I mean, I didn't have career plans. And, and I think I was very lucky to to fall into this interpreting course. Yeah. Um, but just real very quick, lucky to pass. <laughs> just real quick before we get there, uh, I just wanted to know where the, Polish, uh, where the Polish came from, actually. Well, in, in the period that I was an English teacher, um, I'd always had a, a soft spot for Eastern Europe. Yeah. And um, I was looking for jobs and places to teach and uh, Budapest fell through and Prague I didn't fancy and I... I ended up in Krakow in Poland. Oh, in, which is a nice uh, place to end up in. 1993, 1994. Yeah. Had a great time. Mm -hmm. um, learned very little Polish. <laughs> but I wasn't there to learn Polish. I was there to teach English and learn how to teach English right, because I was right. an inexperienced language teacher. But I did have a great time. And so when five or six years later, um, I had graduated from interpreting school mm. and it became clear that one, I needed another language to work with. Uh, and two, Poland was going to be joining the EU at some stage, yeah. if not in the immediate future, then quite soon. Hmm. It, it, it just all came together. And again, I was very, very lucky. I, so I knew I'd had fun in Poland. I'd had a good time in Poland. I had friends. Um, it was much more logical for me to go to Poland and learn Polish than it might have been to, say, go to the Netherlands to learn Dutch or Spain to learn Spanish which would be the linguistically logical things to do if you have French and German as a starting point. Yeah. But for me, it was like, well, Poland is, I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy being there. <laughs> and then I should also be able to learn the language. Yeah. It, it's amazing though, because I'm surprised that now there, there seems to be two groups of interpreters. There seems to be some interpreters who kind of fell into it by accident and made decisions on the basis of, you know, what made sense at the time and there's this other group of kind of deeply planned out careers and deeply thought out careers how did you find it when you started moving from okay interpreting is the sensible thing to do to actually suddenly being on the market and and getting work um did did you what were your feelings when you moved from this is the logical thing to do to oh look there's work in this um well it was weird because i didn't really i mean i Bath University and, and everybody's mindset was very much geared towards working for the European institutions. Mm. There was never, there was never really any um, question of trying to do anything else. If you had French, German, Spanish, or Italian, then you were aiming for Brussels. And if you had Russian, Spanish, and or French, uh, you were aiming for Geneva and the UN. I mean, in hindsight, that, that was a terribly narrow way of looking at things. Um, so when I started, I, I started working for the European Parliament and I only worked for the European Parliament. Um, and my first concern for the first few years was very similar to my concern when I started teaching English. That was being uh, painfully aware of my status as a novice and desperately trying to get better before anybody found out. Yeah. So kind of like the imposter syndrome, maybe. Yeah. Which I um, think is fairly common, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My argument was that it's not an imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's true. Um, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I think to, it is. A lot of interpreters feel like that. Absolutely. Uh, because I think that it is because there is no uh, um, objective judge of quality. Mm. Uh, no one's come up with a, yeah. a simple box ticking exercise that says, okay, that's good. That's not good. Right. And also because by definition, translation and interpretation can't be perfect uh and so it doesn't matter where you are uh, in your career there's always something to worry about if you're prone to worrying about it yeah um, <laughs> so and i think as well there seems to be an organizational culture i was recently came across a book by viola de flu about the kind of how interpreters inculcate culture and become professionals and I, and I think it was in the parliament and it must be difficult going straight into that you know you probably knew the 
the official facts and figures and background from your training, but that's very different to getting there and suddenly having to learn, you know, who's good to work with, who isn't, how to make nice with scheduling and, and all of the things that you learn as you become part of a, of a culture. Well, I mean, I don't want to get into the, the shortcomings of my particular training course in any great detail, but suffice it to say, I didn't know very much about anything when I left. Um, but it, it, one of the peculiarities of the time was that the, the European Parliament used to send its beginners to Luxembourg to, to oh, work in Luxembourg yeah. and um, not actually to work for the Parliament, but to work for the European Commission, because by some weird historical interinstitutional agreement the european parliament recruited interpreters for the meetings of the commission that took place in luxembourg and i think again i mean another example of how very fortunate i've been in my career so far touchwood um the the meetings in luxembourg were limited to a number of specific domains mm. so there's a lot of statistics statistics right there was a lot of public health yep and there were a lot of union meetings mm -hmm. and there were a few other areas but basically it meant that for for a number of years two or three four years um i only worked on a, a limited range of meetings which meant that i got quite good at those and knew what was going on mm. um and there was a lot of repetition i mean repetition is is very important in um in getting better at interpreting and so then when uh I went out into a slightly broader world of the parliament proper and all sorts of subjects were being discussed in all sorts of different meetings and working at the commission in Brussels, which is the same. Uh, it was less of a shock. Uh, mm. and, and I had time to, to catch up on some of the knowledge that wasn't imparted in my training course. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, just, just going back to this imposter syndrome real quickly, I, I think that it's really difficult, especially in the beginning for someone who's just passed the accreditation test, because I mean, The, the sheer fact that you have passed the test means that you're qualified to work there. But then you sit there with colleagues who have been in the booth at the institutions for maybe 30 years and you think, oh my, how do I even deserve to be, you know, in the same space? And But, you know, you, you bring different things to the proverbial table, I think. Yeah, I mean, I remember doing, when I, I, I took um, my Polish accreditation test, I'd already been working for five or six years and uh, I did it and... At the same year, I also had to do an accreditation test for the commission for French and German because at the time, the institutions had split uh, accreditation tests. And when I did the French and German one for the commission, um, I just remember thinking, oh my God, this is so straightforward compared to a normal day at the office. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas whereas a few years before, it had been absolutely the, the best I could possibly hope to do of a day. Um But no, I mean, the, the accreditation tests are, are a good system, but you, you look at them very differently. I mean, from for, for a number of years, you aspire to them. And then when you look back at them, you think, I wish most of the days this week had been as well structured as that speech. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe not 100% representative of the everyday work in the institutions, but yeah. But, but then I, you could say the same about the private market. I was shocking someone recently about um, a couple of, a couple of my favorite assignments and they said oh i hope you told the client never to treat you like that again and i looked at them and i, I responded to them and went are you joking they were my favorite assignments ever mm -hmm. and people just have a fit at the different working cultures that are in interpreting so i take it as read on the, the private market in the uk especially outside of london that you're as likely to be walking around a muddy field in welly boots as you are to be in an air-conditioned conference room mm. and you just you just get on with it and that's and you know The, the running joke in, in, in amongst the Edinburgh interpreters is the agenda is just a list of speeches that will run long, be cancelled or get moved that day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how long into your interpreting career were you when you started get, uh, doing training or, or teaching? And, and what was that first job? Or what? Um, well, it, it tied it together with, the, with the learning Polish, actually, because um, so I'd already, I'd already taught English. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, I was trying to arrange trips to Poland and to, to learn Polish. And the European Parliament were incredibly helpful and generous. I mean, they they used their contacts to find me places to uh, to learn and to teach. And they paid a grant for 
nine or ten months of the time that I spend in Poland. Oh, and that involves teaching, and, doesn't it? Well, it depends. I mean, the first, the very first time I went uh, to Poland for the parliament, I went for a month. And it was a very simple quid pro quo arrangement. Uh, I taught 12 hours a week and I got 12 hours of Polish lessons a week. And I, oh. I think it was, it was relatively informal. It was just one, the, the parliament knew this interpreting school. The interpreting school was happy to have an English native speaker oh, come in who was an interpreter. Yeah. And it, there was never anything on paper. It was mm. just, look, we'll get this teacher to come in and give him one-to-one -one Polish lessons if he does consent classes for our um, students. So that was the very first uh, time I got into teaching. And then um, that was in a place called Łódź, which is about 100 kilometers from Warsaw. And then uh, later I went to Krakow um, for a longer stint. The first one was sort of nine months. And again, I was just informally involved in the hmm. interpreting uh, course there, giving speeches, giving a few classes and practicing, L later practicing, because initially I wasn't good enough to uh, Polish to join in the practicing. But the second year I was yeah. there, it was right. I, we were just as equals, if you like. And I was doing consecs with um, the graduates and with the students. Mm hmm so yeah, it was a natural and not particularly well planned uh, progression, but it worked out very well. Yeah, but I mean, at least at least you had a certain sort of pedag pedagogical toolkit, having been a language teacher before, which may not necessarily be the case for every interpreter who gets sent to some university in this quid pro quo arrangement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's a, it's a very mixed bag for the for the schools. I mean, you can get someone who wants to teach and who is either naturally good at it or has had some training or both yeah, experience um, yeah. or you can find somebody who doesn't necessarily want to teach but has to as part of their deal of the deal there. yeah exactly um and maybe who isn't very good at it and i mean they're not being very good at it may not be their fault i mean they're interpreters after all not um not trainers and you know it's one of the structural issues of interpreter training that so few interpreter trainers have um, been lucky enough to have any sort of teacher training. Hmm. There's not much about. Um, the, in, in fact, the the FTI MAS course, hmm. uh, so the FTI in Geneva, in Geneva yeah. uh, is is the only sort of recognised qualification for interpreter trainers. That's uh, sort of two year MA that they do partly online and partly in Geneva. Yeah. It's still unique in the world and, uh, and fabulous thing that it's there. I assume it's quite but, popular then. Um, I think they're so. always they're always full. Yeah, and it's not cheap. I mean, there's also increasingly as people do PhDs in interpreting, most good PhD universities will offer. Uh, in fact, will require PhD students to do general kind of lecturer training courses. Um, the good thing is that's general good pedagogy that you're learning. On the other hand, it's not specific pedagogy to interpreting. And that's where you need courses like the one in Geneva, because I think there are some specific things about teaching and interpreting that are quite different to, I don't know, standing up and teaching English literature or standing up and teaching French grammar. I don't know, how, where would you, what would you feel about that, Andy? Are there big differences between language teaching and interpreting teaching that means that interpreter trainers need their own specific training? Or would any kind of pedagogical background be enough to make someone a good interpreter trainer? <laughs> Um, well, I think it helps if you have any sort of pedagogical training because the, the, the fundamental similarity between all types of teaching is that you're teaching people mm. and therefore any sort of pedagogical approach that relates to motivation mm. is going to apply across any subject, whether you're teaching table tennis, swimming, interpreting or nuclear physics. Yep. If you can motivate the individual to the subject matter – they are going to learn better and and there are techniques that um that you can use and so if you learn them as a physicist mm. and then later apply them when you're training interpreters that's that's a good thing that's transferable yeah. skills yeah. yeah i mean i think the, the problem with interpreting is that no one's really worked out what all the bits are how they fit together and how you ah. train any of the bits so there's still no sort of established sort of a consensus on, on what interpreting teaching should look like? Well, it, it's, it's, it's weird. I, I mean, the, if you ask students anywhere around the world or trainers 
what they were doing in class mm. um, or you listen in, sit in on a class, people are, are very often saying pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's about the message. You've got to analyze it. You've got to break it down into, into big chunks and little chunks. Um, it's not the words that count. It's, it's what's being said. Th there are some, you, you know, you, that you've got to anticipate that it's not about uh, time lag necessarily yeah. and that time yeah. lag is not a constant thing that it's going to vary depending on the speech depending on what you know the interpreter trainers tend to have um unconsciously the same things in mind when they're teaching they just it's it's how you deliver those lessons mm. i mean it's quite difficult to to um do anything different to the basic Here's a speech, interpret the speech. Mm. I will listen to you interpret the speech. And then, and then we will talk about... And, it, and my, my problem, if you like, is the... My problem. An area that I'm fascinated by and I think needs an awful lot of attention is feedback. Mm -hmm. So oh. if you say to somebody, okay, you, um, you just said uh, the World War, World War II ended in 1942. Um, it, it's easy enough to work out or to say that that's a mistake, but how do you, why was there the mistake and how do you make the interpreter better yes. the next time given that mistake? So for example, saying it was 1945, not 1942 is not very helpful. Um, how do you recreate the thought processes so that the interpreter comes to 1945? Hmm. And you can do that. I mean, in English, in English teaching, they were called, um, uh, um, concept questions, you know, you could ask, so, so, you know, you would tell me about the second world war and you just, oh yeah, well it was 1939 to 1945. It was, uh, it was 45, was it? What did you say in the booth? Well, I said 45, didn't I? And then you just established that it uh, was a slip of the tongue, yeah. not a mistake. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and you, I mean, you elicit the correct answer. And of course, if, if the student doesn't know and the student says, well, no, I, I know the, the speaker made a mistake because the Second World War ended in 1942. So I corrected him and said 1942. Yeah. And then you have two interesting lessons. One, <laughs> one history. Yes. And then one professional behavior. Yeah. Um, should we be correcting the speaker? Mm -hmm. And how certain do you have to be that you're right and they're wrong, given that they're an expert and you're not, oh, yeah. before you start correcting the speaker? So it's, the thing with feedback is not so much to give a long list of mistakes or just to say something was wrong or to give the correction mm. but what's f the sort of fascinating about feedback is how do you um use that analysis after the interpreting to make the interpreter better that's that's what's so difficult yeah um, i i really like the the idea of eliciting but yeah jonathan you were going to say something. yeah i was going to say this reminds me of the debate um i know there's a book recently come out from robin Seton and andrew dorant um, and it was what I found more fascinating than the book coming out itself. They've brought out a book, uh, a student's practice guide, I believe, and also a book for trainers. But it was um, Kelly and Sieber's review of those books, pointing out how there seems to be two approaches to interpreting training. One is just get people in the booth as quickly as you can and get them interpreting mm. and pick it up from there. And then there's another approach, which I've seen growing in popularity, which is the idea that we can break interpreting down into different skills and you were just talking about that data about the analysis it's not about the word said it's about the meaning and this idea that if you find a mistake you can somehow locate the source of that mistake and then train the technique so that that source doesn't come back i'd love to know what your take is on this andy whether you're what the kind of the more people interpret the better they're going to get so just get them in the booth or whether you as a trainer would think okay well that seems to be from the questions I've elicited, that seems to be just an issue on, you know, um, attention sharing, right? Let's work on helping them work on their attention more. No, I mean, my, um, my background as an English teacher made it, makes it very clear to me that you have to isolate the skills and practice them in isolation. But <clears throat> it was interesting. Um, but, so I've always said, yes, let's break up the skills and, and, and practice them in, in isolation, demonstrate them in isolation, try and teach them in isolation. But of course, you can't perfectly isolate them. You, you, you end up focusing on them. And I've always called, so if you say, we're going to try some interpreting, 
but what we're really focusing on is a summary of each paragraph, let's say. And that you could call an analysis exercise where you're not really interpreting, but you want just to summarize each paragraph of the speech as it goes along. And I would call that an isolation exercise where you isolate the analysis. And I went to um, uh, a, a very interesting training of trainers event organized by AIC in Rome, at which Robin Seton was the, the trainer. And he was giving us um, a two-day course on giving feedback. And I had the same discussion with him about isolation or just throwing, putting people in the booth and doing it all in one go. Mm. And he was very much um, on the side of putting them in the booth and doing it all in one go. Except that he then start, he, he was then saying, yes, but of course we focus on this at this stage in the course. And then we focus on this at the next stage of the course. And actually both of us were, were saying more or less the same thing. Only I was calling it isolation and blurring the fact that it was happening at the same time as some interpreting. And he was calling it interpreting and blurring the fact that there was some isolation going on. Yeah. Uh, so I don't actually think that um, Seton and Darren's book is particularly about putting people into the booth and making them do it all at once. Although it kind of reads like that in places. Um, I mean, I have to take the, if, we could, if we're talking about that book, I have to take the opportunity just to say that it's an absolute marvel, um, the, the fact that they've written it. I mean, it's, it's, mm. you know, it's huge. When I saw the title, when I first saw the title, a complete course in conference interpreting, I was like, wow, that is one ambitious title. Really? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. that was brave. and then, I, and then yeah. I read it and I was like, my God, it actually, it might just live up to that title. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a huge book in every sense of the word. Mm. Um, and a wonderful resource. I mean, I love the fact that the, in your books, and I'm also aware of the work from a, a guy in Slovakia called Martin Jovchos, who's been working with his wife, who's a speech therapist, on literally pure isolation exercises. So they worked a lot on the idea of verbal fluency and how um, a lot of interpreters, especially early in their career, struggle with this word on the tip of the tongue thing, and they just can't find it. And they found out that there is there are neurological issues around that that you can help people solve. Um, and that seems to be going a step further from, you know, we're going to interpret, but I just want you to concentrate on into, no, actually, let's see if we can find exercises that literally just pull on one skill. And I think, was it in your book where it's like, you know, let's look at summarizing things without interpreting them and let's just look at a skill that we can do with an exercise. That seems to be going a step further. And it'd be, be interesting to see how far interpreter training goes with that or whether we keep with the general feel of the more booth time, the better. Hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I mean I've, I'm a, I've always been a big fan of text. I suppose that is a, a more uh, pure form of isolation. You, you look at a text and try and analyze it, then obviously you don't have the time pressures of in, interpreting at the same time. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I maintain that that's, it's a very important stage to go through if only to demonstrate what you then want them to do in the booth. I mean, I don't think saying just more booth time is better. I think that's probably too simplistic. You do need a lot of booth time, but you have to, you don't have a lot of class time. So you have to mm. divide the class time up quite carefully because you need to introduce, a, say, a technique or a concept. Mm. You need to demonstrate it. You need to maybe have them practice it in some sort of isolation and then apply it to the actual skill of interpreting. I mean, that last phase is, is what they call, um, I believe deliberate practice when mm -hmm. you, you do the full skill, but you focus on one part of it one aspect, yeah. and that apparently makes you better at the, the whole skill. But then for every hour that the students do in class, they've got to do four or five hours of practice, um, over the rest of the week. So, mm -hmm. They will have to, I mean, flying miles is always an issue that you, you have to, you have to get experience and we are all much better interpreters after, I th if we've tried to become better after five years in the booth. I think that's we a very important if. When, we, yeah. <laughs> when we started. Yeah, right. no, you do have to try. And I mean, um, yeah. the, the, uh, uh, Elizabeth Tesalius's um, research that appeared in Jonathan's book, mm. um, 
shows that you that might be it you have to you might have to try <laughs> yeah. to to get better and then you come back to motivation but that a, a different type of motivation you know yeah but we can talk about motivation maybe maybe later but i'm, I'm wondering if there's it's, maybe it's a bland question but is, is there sort of an ideal interpreting trainer because i mean you want different things i think out of an interpreting trainer they should be a practitioner ideally so they should know what they're talking about but they should also have i guess the th the pedagogical tools to be able to sort of explain um to to, to it's difficult to put in words but but to explain what they do in the booth uh why they do it um and and sort of not not just tell war stories in class but you know make sure that students can really make use of that for their own practice um yeah i mean I, I, there's probably not one ideal um because students are different and some students mm -hmm. react differently to different types of trainer and um there are broadly maybe two sort of pedagogical cultures you know the anglo-saxon american nordic okay one and then the sort of southern french russian oh. i would say, you know very but that's that, that's not just about interpreting that's you know um that's a cultural thing it's a cultural thing in in the north america students are, are encouraged to give them positive constructive feedback mm -hmm. um what some people might call molly molly coddled you know in <laughs> they're, they're not word, yeah. they're not beaten with sticks yeah. as they were 150 years ago uh, whereas in in france from the youngest age and i have two kids in french school the only thing that's highlighted are the mistakes yeah. um which is a completely different mindset it uh, is, yeah. and that you you can see some of that in interpreting classes um so the idea but an ideal trainer no yeah no, an, an ideal trainer would be someone who who wants to be there mm. who is interested in the literature mm -hmm. um yes who's a practicing interpreter somebody who's who's willing to demonstrate i mean there are a lot of structural problems with um interpreter training uh one of them yeah. one of them is that it's very badly paid compared to actually interpreting and that means that people will prefer interpreting financially even if they don't already in prefer interpreting professionally mm -hmm. oh. and it also means that it's very difficult for an interpreting school to encourage their teachers to put say a day into attending a training course for teachers because that day is worth x hundred euro on the market and the school is not going to pay them for that day and even if it did it would be a third of what they they could earn interpreting so it's quite difficult to either ask people to attend training courses as trainers or to for you can't force them um a lot of teacher training is is borderline voluntary borderline charity work because the, the it requires the, a lot of dedication the, yeah. well the pay scale is set by the university yeah and uh you know take a look at spain after the financial crisis the public sector in spain took a 30 percent pay cut mm. across the board yeah. including the universities including interpreting trainers in the universities so well already wasn't very well paid uh, became terribly badly paid and if people are doing something uh on an almost volunteer basis then clearly they might not hang around for a long time then two years maybe five maybe not mm. um, so you get a high turnover you get a high turnover yeah. then you lose expertise mm. um, uh, a lot of schools revolve around one individual who holds it all together and when that individual retires or leaves yeah. then the school uh, falls apart or just closes down yeah and i think another problem is also that interpreting courses usually don't have the highest standing in any given university i think it's fair to say no no i mean it, it because we're not academics as well i mean i had i had this issue in poland where i mean i was i wasn't even an i didn't even have an m i don't have an ma i never did an ma at the time it was a uh, a postgraduate diploma the interpreting course and um there was a certain amount of friction when i was teaching in the university in poland because I mean, one, I was less well qualified than the students who were, had to have an MA to get on the course. But oh, obviously, yeah. the other, everyone else teaching was a PhD. Yeah. And um, so t some some people didn't uh, didn't like that idea. So yeah, in interpreting is often uh, the outsider 
in the academic world. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you do have you have pressure from the other side, so I'm speaking as someone who who desperately wants to make research teaching and practice. And the push from the universities, apart from a couple that I know well and I highly respect, a lot of the uni- uh, sorry, a lot of the research funders will want to claim 100% of your time. Now, for me, if you're wanting to research and teach interpreting, that should never happen because if you're teaching and researching 100% of the time and you're not actually interpreting anymore, the likelihood is within a few years you're going to go squirrely. And I've I've mm-hmm. seen that um, I've seen that at academic conference where not so much with interpreting where People tend to push back, but I have seen academics where it's clear that they started off as practitioners, they got into research, they, they're teaching people to do a profession that they're no longer doing. And mm. so their thinking is so behind reality that it's actually sad. And you know fine well that if they were allowed to go out like a day a week to go and practice, things would change overnight. Mm. But research funders, especially in some universities, but not all, but some universities are very much like, you're a, if you're a teacher, you're a teacher. And that's not something that can ever work in interpreting because of the way I'm amazed how much interpreting has changed in the 10 years since I qualified. Mm. Um, you have to be keeping up with what's going on. Otherwise, you're not teaching people the skills they need to do the job. Yeah, that's another of the structural yeah. problems. That, I mean, some universities set up their interpreting programs so that teachers can go out and interpret and i know of at least one where yeah their their staff they have full-time staff posts but they are allowed to go and do 60 days interpreting a year which is essential but i mean that's that's a very good setup most interpreting schools uh hire their trainers as freelancers for a few hours a week Um, and that's another structural problem if you're only teaching three hours a week then um it's not a big part of your working week and that means that you're not devoting a lot of, you may not be devoting a lot of time to it apart from those few hours in the school. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, the, the whole thing that Jonathan mentioned, like with the, the CPD and keeping up with developments and, and ideally research as well. I mean, that was always the sort of the big tradition in German universities is that you would, you would combine research and teaching. I don't know how much is left of that now with all the reforms that have happened. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an issue if, if you, if you just get hired as a, as a, as a freelancer, I mean, I have a. I, I, I used to read the research. Um, I don't read quite so much of it now, but uh, th- there's a definite need for um, somebody to show the usefulness of mm. research in the classroom. There's there's mm. this gap <laughs> between what's all what's been written and what's been studied in in the and or you can read in the academic journals and then yeah. what that means for um, classroom teaching. Because at the moment, the two don't really join up. The teachers haven't read the research and those of us who have, or some of us who have, like me, aren't quite sure what use it is anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's quite harsh. I mean, I don't mean it quite. No, there, but I there's, think it's there's a gap between yeah. the two. It's, it's, a fair, it, it's a fair comment and it's something that we dis- we discussed on the research episode of the podcast as well as the what got me writing the first book, and we want to plug your book, not my book, but what got me writing the first we'll get book to that. Was, was, was my annoyance at coming across actually research from sign language interpreting and community interpreting, which I could see applied equally well in conference interpreting. And I was beginning to apply and see a difference, but most professionals would never come across for various reasons. And if they did come across that the language was so different to the language they use every day, it made no sense to them anyway. Mm. Um, and, and it is this this need for joining up um, teaching research practice and also in a sense and I know I might be alone in this but joining up what we've learned across all forms of interpreting because we have so much in common that, that, that isn't seen because we're used to thinking I'm a conference interpreter I do conference interpreting yeah. um, to be able to to set interpreters of all stripes in a room together and learn from each other, I think, actually deals with some of the issues quicker than we imagine. I think they have a more ecumenical approach to it in the States um, mm. with uh, something like Interpret America, which is a you know, huge annual conference that brings together interpreters from all different types of interpreting and they get together and exchange and talk to each other and in Europe, conference interpreting has kept itself to itself uh, a lot. 
there's, there's more overlap now, but I think that's this historical. It seems to me as well that there's that. more sort of cross pollination. Yeah, that's true. But there was one thing I wanted to ask you about: Is there actually uh, research on interpreting teaching? So are people looking into all these things that you mentioned? You know, what 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 teachers say in the classroom, do in the classroom? Does it actually work, and does it bring the best results, or could things maybe be done differently? Um, not that I've come across. I mean, the the pedagogical ideas I learned as a as a language teacher were just passed down to me by my trainers and I never read any research or proof like, like a craft like a yeah, yeah I, I mean I never down, yeah. I, I never got to whether I assumed that there was a scientific background to it but what <laughs> yeah. what they taught us worked and so we carried on doing it um in uh that's not necessarily a bad thing I'm just curious as to you know whether in was... interpreting I think the thing is that you you we still don't know how to judge quality in any sort of objective fashion. And if you can't judge Will quality, yeah, that's <laughs> if you can't judge quality, then how can you judge the standard of the teaching yeah. that gets to some sort of quality assessment at the end? Right. Um, I mean, there's also the fact that different people get it. You know, students sort of start being able to interpret at different stages. That's what you said earlier. Yeah, different students um, sort of need different... S- some people input. might take four or five years. Uh, some Somebody might get it in nine months. Mm. Um, so at what stage you try and assess the success of the teaching methods mm. will give you different results as well. So I don't, I don't know of any research into teaching methods in interpreter training. The, um, there is a dedicated journal called the Interpreter and Translator Trainer. Um, from my knowledge, there's been more research in sign language interpreter training than conference interpreter training, although I could be wrong. Mm. Um, but most of the teaching literature that I've come across has actually been dominated by translation. And there's an approach in translation training, which I can't see how you would work at an interpreting because they've got what's called a social constructivist approach, which is very common now, where rather than the teachers say this is right, this is wrong, they're getting people to work together and generate things themselves. And a lot of kind of, you know, peer thinking and uh, giving people real jobs to work on and things. And some of that only works in something like translation, where you can sit and discuss a solution Hmm. while you're solving the problem. I'm not sure how you would do, and I'm sure someone will listen to this and tell me that I'm wrong. But I'm not sure how you would do a social constructivist interpreting classroom when you've got what you know two hours a week or however many contact hours that they need to be interpreting in. Um, it, it doesn't seem achievable. I don't know if I would call it social constructivism, but you, that doesn't sound like a, a, it's a million miles away from the sort of Tefl idea of eliciting the. The solution or discovery learning. Yes. Mm. I mean, yes, you can't do it simultaneously, but you can, for example, sit three people down and say, okay, listen to the first five minutes of this speech and work out amongst yourselves without interpreting what the difficulties of this speaker are. And they might listen to five minutes and say, okay, so he doesn't finish any sentences. Yeah. Um, he's using brackets as, as though you had to have at least one set in every sentence. Um, and then, okay, so you've established that. Now, how are you going to deal with it when you go into the booth? And they might, mm. hopefully you've, you've taught them the odd thing. Of, and they might say, okay, so the strategy for dealing with brackets and parentheses and unfinished sentences is probably to chop things up into shorter sentences. Um, the famous salami which is a or units of meaning a, a tech, a tech, or units of meaning <laughs> whatever you it's, want it's a tech well they're slightly different i think but, <laughs> okay um, yeah. but they both work as, as strategies and then you you said okay so we've listened to five minutes you've decided that that is the strategy to take with this speaker now off you go into the booth and we're going to do the first five minutes that you've already heard and the next five minutes which you haven't heard see if you can apply the strategy that you just said. So that sounds a little bit like your social constructivism applied to, to interpreting. Um, I mean, the, the, there's an awful lot you, you can do. Um, I mean, I regret that, you know, I had the most basic of teacher training. I had, it was a one month training course. And then I was lucky enough to teach for a year hmm. in a school where we had sort of regular training people would come in and watch your class and and comment and give you feedback and help you so um but it's still in the world of tefl relatively basic i had a couple of years experience in a 
a month of formal training and, and a year of sort of on the job training, um, better teachers with more teacher training could come up with infinite number of um, solutions to these problems. But I think that the fact is that there aren't enough, uh, I don't want to say real teachers, but there aren't enough people with a full pedagogical training behind yeah, them yeah. to come in and look at interpreting and say, okay, let's try and teach it that way or that way. Um, I mean, one of the, the many projects that I started and never managed to finish was uh, contacting a, an old friend of mine who was a, a good and experienced and well-qualified teacher of English as a foreign language. And uh, I said to her, look, I, I want you to go and watch two days of interpreter training classes and tell me what you, as a non-interpreter but trained teacher, would do in that situation, trying to teach those things. And um, yeah. she went and she watched and she wrote a couple of reports for me and whatever, but it never it never turned into the the course for trainers that uh, I had been planning. Many, you know, as many projects do, it sort of just faded away somewhere. <laughs> yeah, because you just don't find the time. That's right. But speaking of time, that's something I wanted to uh, to get to in, in, in terms of sort of constraints that interpreter training has, is that it seems to me that... Uh, interpreting programs get shorter all the time it seems to me sometimes i mean i i had sort of the whole four or five years including semesters abroad so i really had time to sort of develop uh, my skills work on my skills but now you have sort of one year programs two year programs sometimes sometimes they even start consecutive simultaneous at the same time i mean i, I find it almost hard to believe that you can put put all of that into that course i, I don't think it's a change i think it might be a change in germany okay because yeah that's in, possible in yeah. in germany there have always been these five year courses uh in the uk and france there's it's always, it's always been, been and short. in belgium there've been five year courses oh. but in the uk and france or or poland uh it's always been a one or two year course right um so it might be that in germany there's a, a move towards one or two year courses yeah because of the whole masters but, um, um, thing yeah That, that's not been a change okay. in the UK or France. Mm. But to, to get to the second part of your question, yeah, I mean, a year is very, is very short. Um, and um, uh, a year is the absolute minimum, for example, that AIC recommends for uh, an interpreter training uh, course. Yeah. As to starting consecutive and simultaneous at the same time, I mean, Jonathan might well um, be twitching to say something but but that's never that's you know it's never been proven yeah. that you have to teach consecutive first and simultaneous second and uh that it's just we've always done it that it's, way it's right? always yeah. been done that way but yeah. um you, i mean you may well have come across uh sylvia kalina mm, of course yeah. over the years she was one of the first people i heard say you know yeah we've done it like this but there's no There's absolutely no proof that you have to yeah. do it like that. And she was an advocate of teaching both more or less from the start. Okay. Um, mm. And it, I mean, interestingly, when I, I remember when I started interpreting, yeah. it was always simultaneous. Um, and then th two years later, three years later, I went back to teaching and started doing a lot of consecutive, admittedly in a classroom situation, but doing a lot of consecutive. And my consecutive had got lots better because I'd been doing simultaneous for three years. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean, is it? I the university that I was at, I was slightly disappointed. That I didn't know that an undergraduate interpreting degree actually existed. So Harriet Watt, who've had an undergraduate interpreting degree, certainly for as long as I've been qualified, um, and possibly before. In fact, probably quite a long time before. So those kind of longer degrees have existed in the UK as undergraduate programs. The problem is, is that you certainly in Scotland undergraduate programs are pressured to emphasize transferable skills because as the understanding that not a high proportion of graduates will actually become interpreters so my my master's degree was in translation and conference interpreting Harriet what now the last I checked have a pure conference interpreting masters but again there was a market reality going on at the time and arguably still now that outside of London no one in the UK can get by financially just being a conference interpreter unless they're on like a parliament list or a, an international organization list. Hmm. On the private market, everyone's interpreter. And, and so it makes sense, actually, that you're learning translation interpreting at the same time. We, I believe we started, I think we may have started simultaneous before consent because I remember doing simultaneous very early in the programming going, 
what is this? Because I got my feet wet in interpreting doing short consecutive in front of 200 young people in Brighton and then in, in Dunkirk. Um, but yeah, there's this, every time someone tells me about, you know, what my training didn't say, I used to agree with them and now I turn around and say, well, okay, how long was your training? It was yeah, a year. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so we can't expect it, sadly, and I know a few university people would probably agree with me quietly on this, you can't expect to go from you're good at two languages to you're a fully-fledged professional interpreter ready to go in nine months or a year. Mm. There, there are, there's just too many skills to for that to be realistic. And so when I was actually thinking of going next, and this is something that I've noticed you doing more of, Andy, was the gap between graduation and working is quite steep in interpreting. And I've, I've noticed that you're bringing books out and there seems to be there seems to be more understanding of the need to bridge that gap and do CP, kind of post-graduation CPD. I, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have, have realised that. I mean, um, yeah, uh, I've I've done a lot of work for the European Parliament over the years and and I've attended a lot of... Um, the European Commission's universities conferences for for the universities that teach interpreter training, and you over the years regularly heard the, the fairly steady figure of thirty to thirty five percent as a pass rate for the accreditation tests. Mm. And if you Jonathan think was asking about that in a recent if, episode, yeah, yes, I heard that. I, oh. I did some homework and listened okay, to thank you so much. Of, <laughs> and <laughs> listened to a couple of episodes. Um, and uh, yes, um, the so if you consider that you can't take an accreditation test unless you have a recognised postgraduate MA in conference interpreting, I mean, they won't even let you in the, the building without that <laughs> as true, a starter. Yeah. And then you think that the pass rate is only 35%. And, and this has been something that the institutions have been trying to solve um, for, for at least the last 15 years. So they've had... Um, schemes where they try and offer some extra teaching at the end of the postgraduate course. They've had schemes where they offer some extra teaching just after someone narrowly fails the accreditation test yes. to try and get them ready for a second accreditation test. Um, they've they've tried all sorts of schemes, but the the figure has remained stubbornly at thirty five percent for. For a very long time. I mean, I, I haven't been involved in that for four or five years now, and I don't know where it is now. But certainly from, um, say, 2005 to 2015, I think 35% was a pretty standard number that never changed. And I think this is something, again, this is a topic that's common across all of interpreting. I was recently involved in a, a project with some people from sign language interpreting. It's not an accreditation test, but they're finding this gap incredibly hard to jump and when they're in a field I guess like the institutions where there's a shortage of good qualified interpreters you don't want that gap that people could fall down and never be found again and it makes me wonder if we look at these gaps and we say it's a teaching issue or it's a quality issue is there actually something about mentorship and about understanding that it's nurture and not just training courses that fix it that might get us somewhere towards resolving it, especially with more and more studies about, you know, what does it mean to become a professional interpreter? Should we be looking at this through the eyes of actually mentorship and and walking people through the process rather than saying, you know, let's send another teacher in and hope that works? I think, I mean, one thing that no one can teach is, is experience. You can anticipate experience, but the fact is that when you have heard a thousand speeches, you start intuitively to recognize patterns and come up with solutions. Um, and so, I mean, really, if, if somebody graduates and they're motivated enough, they should probably just spend at least the first summer, if not the first year, um, dummy boothing or interpreting any of the thousands of conferences that are available online now. I mean, you just have to type in uh, wind turbine and conference into Google and you'll find an hour and a half, two hours of, of a conference that you can use as interpreting material and just gain experience. I mean, that's, it is very useful. I, 
and I don't see how a training course can offer that because you don't really want to make it into a four year training course where the last two years are basically dummy boozing. Um, eventually you, you, you need to get out there. Mentoring is a great idea. I mean, I think, um, IEK in Germany have a mentoring scheme, uh, on the private market. The institutions have certainly had, the European institutions have certainly had mentoring schemes. Um, I don't know much about them. Um, but it seems like a good idea. And sometimes you just get people who are nice and friendly and avuncular and will mentor sort of off their own bat. Um, and that's, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I, I try to be constructive and nice to anyone who's starting out because the, one of the first people I worked with was particularly unhelpful and unpleasant to me. And, and I know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, yeah I think we all and, do. Yeah. And, 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 you know, stuff that isn't taught, even if it's taught, I think even if you teach somebody how the European institutions function, for example, when you sit down in a meeting room, mm. you still don't know how that meeting room functions. It's a completely different thing. Yeah, I noticed that when I started. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no one ever said to me, look, in this room, you have the representatives of, uh, at the time, um, how many member states in 1997, six? Um, 12, I 12 think. You yeah. have 12 member states. They're sitting around the table. They... Um, are being reported to by the commission on what the commission has done, or alternatively, they're reporting back to the commission on how they have implemented European regulation that was at one stage proposed by the commission, was then adopted by the council or the parliament, and the commission is now in charge of monitoring the application of. Mm -hmm. And that was never explained. And so yep. for a long time, I didn't have the overview of why the hell anyone was talking to anybody. And it, as, as people explained that to me Absolutely, or I worked yeah. it out for myself, it all became much, much clearer. And so um, you, you can teach people how the EU works and it still doesn't help when you get into the meeting room. Because it's too abstract, yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the, this is where I'm glad to see Harry at War are sending a lot of their trainees to the Scottish Parliament to see how kind of parliamentary discussions work and how debates work because... The biggest skill that I've picked up in interpreting in my 10 odd years of practice is being able to walk into a room and within like the first couple of shifts, read what where the room is going and what's happening. And you don't realize, you know, if you train in a classroom with speech after speech, you don't realize that every speech you're ever going to interpret is being said for a reason. And there are some speeches, and, and everyone laughs about them, there are some speeches that are realistically just said to fresh air because they have to be said. You know, everyone knows what's already in it. Everyone's already, it, you know, read it. But for the record, that has to be said. And there are other speeches where people are really trying to persuade and change minds. And you have to sometimes adjust your techniques and adjust your expectations of your own output according to what the, what's going on in the room. I mean, it's very different. I don't know if you find this. I find it very different to interpret in a room where it's basically just reading out reports that have to go in the minutes as in like AGMs versus a room where, you know, someone's trying to sell or someone's trying to persuade or where there's just been a giant argument happening. To me, that's, that's a very different interpreting situation. And you can't, I don't know if you can train someone to as to how to behave when the people are on the verge of punching each other. Well, I mean, you can, I mean, you, you can give people different types of speeches. That's not, um, uh, I don't think that's so much of a problem. I think the idea of sending people to the Scottish parliament to, to see how it works is brilliant because actually, I mean, a lot of people don't know how a parliament works and mm. you, a lot of the accusations that are leveled, for example, at the European parliament by people who don't like the European parliament could equally be leveled at uh, any national parliament. It's just that yeah. people, a lot of people don't know how parliaments work. I mean, and, and it's quite stuffy and it's quite bureaucratic and, but that's the way that laws are, are made. And um, working out how any meeting functions before you actually have to interpret it is, is incredibly useful, be it a parliamentary committee, a board meeting, uh, a press conference, a works council, a negotiation, uh, a witness deposition. If you know how the room functions, and I mean, that's the usefulness, I think, of, of mentors or senior colleagues who are, are benevolent, well-disposed towards beginners where... You just explain explain the room 
to somebody. All the implicit stuff that yeah. is never made explicit yeah. I mean, unless you figure it out yourself. <laughs> it's, 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 it's um, you know, for example, very often it's, look, uh, this is a big program. Germany's paying for it. That Keep that in mind. Mm, yeah. And that, And then you understand why Germany is arguing this and this. Absolutely, because yeah. the money for this is coming from Germany specifically. Or, yeah. or from might, the net payers or whatever. Might, yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, exactly. you know, it, it's, um, it might be that the, the main manufacturing site for something is in Italy. Mm, yeah. And if you don't know that, yes. then you don't know why the Italians are, are chipping in element. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you associate Italian industry with one thing, but actually they're very big on the core of this uh, discussion today. And the, 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 the undertones come from knowing all the background, yeah. knowing how the, the room works. Yeah, I, I remember in a, a fisheries policy meeting, only suddenly realizing why a couple of the fishermen were being so passionate about this patch of sea that I'd never heard of before. Um, when one of them said, my dad fished there and my dad's dad fished there and his dad fished there. And suddenly all of the argument and the debate and the passion, which to me was just over, you know, a patch of sea that looks like any other patch of sea, suddenly it makes sense. And suddenly the, you know, big chunks of the meeting to come make a lot of sense when you understand that, you know, this is personal to these people and actually it's not just a nondescript patch of sea. And um, being able to keep in mind that people actually care about this stuff. Actually, I don't know. Uh, to me, that makes better interpreting when you realize someone cares about this. I, mean, the, I think background is, is hugely important. And it's something that I've got, in, I've got into trying to teach um, in the last few years, uh, teaching preparation. So a method for uh, finding out as much as you possibly can about speakers before they say anything. And I mean, th the internet and Google and YouTube make that relatively easy and you can you can find out an awful lot if you know what to look for and if you know that sort of stuff That's in advance thing, yeah. rather than just you know the, the difference between knowing that the man in front of you is a passionate Scottish fisherman whose family have been in fishing for the last 150 years and whose livelihood is fishing and who only owns one boat and that's that's what he does to feed his six kids and not knowing that before he opens his mouth yeah, and having to work it out sense. whilst he's talking, it's a completely different ball game. And, yeah. um, and this is one of the things that experience gives you. You, you know more about who's in the room and what they stand for and what the German delegation might say and what the French delegation will probably say. And so the, the, the student, inter the graduate interpreter coming onto the market is disadvantaged twice by their lack of experience you know they they don't have all this background information before the person starts speaking um which we have that helps us make sense of it all jonathan you wanted to get to to a topic that's close to your heart well, well one thing that andy and i share in common um and i forgot to mention that andy did review my first book cry and i'm very grateful for that review and all the helpful positive feedback <laughs> about one thing that I'm really fascinated about, Andy, is is the books that you've been writing about interpreting. And you said your latest one is the consecutive, the new, is that a new edition of consecutive interpreting, or is that a new book entirely? Um, the 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 book I published in 2005 was called Note Taking for Consecutive, yeah. and that was republished in uh, 2014 or 2016. I can't remember um, as a second edition with a with a few major changes, but basically. Uh, just an update and then this year uh, I published a book called Consecutive Interpreting so the whole of consecutive rather than just the note taking and so it includes uh, things like presentation skills analysis preparation uh, reformulation uh, it, it's basically based on a, a course that I taught for um, a while and, and teach again now uh, in in Paris, which was a sort of consecutive the whole thing in in a in a fourteen week course, and that's become a a book. So if you like the this book, the consecutive book should have come first, and the note taking should have come second yeah. as an a, as a more detailed examination of the note taking chapter of the consecutive book. But 
it, uh, it was the other way around. Yeah. But it, it's a book full of exercises, right? That's my understanding. It's, um, so it, it's not like just a, a, a dry manual or an explanation of what consecutive interpreting it, is. The, it, it's, uh, I suppose what each chapter tries to do is explain um, the ideal for that particular skill, like presentation, and then offer some exercises for practicing the ideal. So explanation and demonstration of what you might be trying to aim at, and then some exercises, or some description of the progression as to how to practice, and then also the sort of uh, layering of the skills. So once you've you've worked on the presentation, you've got that down, then the next chapter is about working without notes and of course, when you start trying to do uh, consecutive interpreting without notes, you're thinking a lot about what you can remember and what you can't. And so your presentation goes to pot. And so th th when yeah. you've been through both of those chapters, then the job is to combine them and try and remember what you've heard and present well. And so on. And so through the book, build, you, keep you build on, your on skills, each yeah. skill. I mean, it, it's not a perfect isolation and cumulative or incremental addition of skills, but that's sort of the, the basic idea underlying it. How much notice did you take of the new forms? Because I'm aware that there's a new form of consecutive called simultaneous consecutive that seems to have just blown up recently. Did you take any notice of that or did you just concentrate on what we would call pure kind of long form consecutive with notes? Well, there, there's, a chap, there's a short chapter in the book about um, uh, technology assisted consecutive, I think I call it. I mean, this actually has quite a this has quite a long history, but um, in Europe, it's never really caught on. I mean, uh, it, it, the first um, the first mention of it is, is a, a staffer from the Italian booth in the Commission called Michele Ferrari, I think, who famously, in inverted commas, famous in our tiny world of interpreting, famously did a consecutive speech of uh, Neil Kinnock, then yes, commissioner. At a, at a press conference. And yeah. he's a very wordy and very articulate politician. Indeed. And, um, our colleague, uh, Michele Ferrari, was a bit worried about getting all of the, the, the nuance and the poetry of Kinnock's um, presentation in long consecutive. And so he recorded it on a, a voice recorder, dictaphone, as they were called at the time, and then did a simultaneous back from the recording. Um, and possibly his notes. I don't actually know uh, whether he used notes yeah, as well at sure. the time. Yeah. Anyway, that, Maybe just a few. Yeah. He, he wrote an interesting article about it. It was discussed at the odd conference. And then um, nothing much really happened with it. I mean, he came back to it a few years later and added notes. Um, a couple of people published articles in the States in 2004 and 2005 about using um, uh, recordings for consecutive. Then in 2009... Um, I think a company called LiveScribe invented a smart pen and um, a colleague called Mark Orlando from Melbourne started using that for training and then that picked up again in the States a bit more than in Europe for actual consecutive rather than just training. So it's it's been around for more than well, nearly 20 years Um but it's never really taken off. And I, I mean, I th my feeling is that we don't do much consecutive and therefore to learn, yeah. that, to learn to use the smart pen properly or even note taking on an iPad, but to learn this extra skill and then not to use it often enough to have it ingrained and natural simply puts us off and we stick with the old note taking, which we still have to shake the rust off uh, when we do consecutive. But I, I mean... It's, so the, the technological consecutive has, has been around for, for actually for quite a long time, but doesn't seem to have become commonly used in the States, uh, commonly used in Europe. In the States, Even in the more. States, I think it, maybe it gets more used in, in, in some settings like medical or legal, I, I don't know. But even there, it, it, it seems to be a, a relatively small niche, I think. But it gets yeah. discussed a lot, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean interesting to see whether... Um, I think generational change is very slow in interpreting because <laughs> interpreters can be in the same job for for 40 years. And so you, you can be under 30 and interpreting, uh, working with somebody who's nearly 70. And and so to change what the majority of interpreters do would, would take a long time. And I mean, Alex and um, Josh Goldsmith are doing some very interesting stuff with 
tablet computers and note taking will that take off you know uh, it's it seems I mean, even using a tablet to take notes while you're doing simultaneous in the booth seems perfectly feasible mm. uh, and logical. And yeah. yet, not a lot of people are doing it yet. Sure. Uh, so yeah, it, to come back to the original question, I mentioned the technologically assisted consecutive in the book. I, I don't give it a lot of space. Um, I, I don't think it would be taught particularly differently. I think it's a very interesting teaching tool. Um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. The way Marco Lendo uses it is very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Think, yeah. Even chatting to Mark, he was up in Edinburgh for the CUTU conference, I think, last year. Um, and chatting to him about it, his, I expected him to be, you know, on the ITI board, we, I think we still have, or had a lady called Mahay Omatwali, who is like a champion of, of Simkinsec. But when you talk to Mark, he seems to see it more as a teaching tool than as a kind of in-your-face professional technique. And it's just amazing how things seem to rise up as they as they get a champion, as they get people who are super excited about it, they become popular. Um, and it will be interesting to see. I mean, I certainly in, in the private market here, I could see a lot of headaches with its use because of things like non-disclosure agreements, and you know, you'd have to ask for permissions for recordings, and also if you're in, you know, if you're in a factory, is it going to give you anything when you've got all the background? You know, there's all of these issues. But on the other hand, it's exciting that it, we can see that interpreting is taking account of new technology. But how long would it take for it? I mean, as, as you said, how much consec do people actually do nowadays? Um, long consec with notes that the last time I did it was about three, four years ago, and it was really, really rusty to the point that I ended up just doing whispered and uh, sim because it was easier. Hmm. But but uh, yeah, maybe getting back to the book then then who's the who's the book for then because you both say that there isn't really a lot of consec going on well it's i mean consec is still considered uh half of conference interpreting and so it, and i think it's uh, true i think it's and, it's, and i mean i'm yeah. a huge fan of consec and i think it's it's a fabulous uh, thing to learn how to do um it, it is i mean daniel Gilles wrote an interesting article uh, uh, well, a long time ago now uh, about why consec was a useful teaching tool and you know you you can separate things out a little bit more easily yeah. and th the analysis and the reformulation for example are, are, are very similar to what you need to do in simultaneous it's just that you don't have to listen to the original at the same time as you're listening to the interpreter and so you can better work out maybe where the interpreter's problems lie and and that then is a very um uh, interesting tool. I mean, the book is is for is for students and for trainers. Um, it, it's uh, so you could use it for self study with your peers, for example, as a student. You, you'd get exercises for your out of classroom practice, for yeah, example. Absolutely, excellent. Yeah, and also, I mean, I'm amazed that the other things you do. So we've got interpreting info. We have. Uh, other resources as well that that you kind of work on or, or help put the interpreter training resources website and and Facebook page and it's I am impressed by someone who's so enthusiastic about getting training right even though as we've found out in this episode it's a bit of an uphill struggle <laughs> um of all of the questions that you get in interpreting.info is there any any question that's really stood out to you made you think actually that's an issue that we need to deal with um, well, I mean, first I should say interpreting.info is not my uh, idea. It was set up by IEEC and by IEEC's uh, IT provider at the time. But um, it turned out to be an excellent place for people to ask questions and for anybody who felt like answering them to answer them. And, and about 10 or 15 of us did become regular contributors, uh, mostly answering questions. But I mean, I also ask a few questions there. Um, th there are some sort of questions that come up fairly regularly. It's usually about language combinations. One, one of the ones that comes up a lot is about language combinations and potential markets. Yeah. Um, and the right course to you, take and the right university. And, and <laughs> which university to choose or uh, yeah. do you know anything about a given university. But, you know, for example, people will, quite often people will be asking about the usefulness of Arabic as a C. And the answer is is generally always the same, which is that, there's no private market for Arabic because a C, it's an AB language, and um, the United Nations doesn't have, doesn't allow inverted commas, 
uh, any Arabic C interpreting. It's all done as a retour from the Arabic booth into English or French. Um, and and the same goes for Chinese, I think, at the UN. And so that's one thing. And then you have people saying, yeah, well, you know, should I learn? I've, I, have, uh, I have English as an A, French, Portuguese, and I'd like to learn another language. Should I learn Russian? And... Uh, you, and you say, well, you know, it depends what you want to do. But, yeah. you know, Russian, again, is more of a, an AB language on the private market. And it's quite and an investment as a C language. It, yeah. It's a big investment. And also it doesn't fit very well with, say, Portuguese or German because you, you have EU languages and you have UN languages. And, yeah. you know, the perfect UN combination for uh, an English booth is Spanish, French and Russian. Um, and if you had Portuguese, it would be inverted commas wasted. I mean, I think they have meetings with Portuguese at the UN. But so there's a lot of language combination questions. There's a lot of um, uh, professional domicile questions. Where should I live? And uh, as you said, there's a lot of questions about where, what school uh, one should go and study at. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a very good, um, it's a very good forum, actually. There's a, there's a lot of interesting questions put, but yeah, I'd say those are the three most uh, frequent areas that people ask about. Yeah. Is there any new book in the pipeline for you or any, any, any book that you would potentially write at some point in the future about training or? Well, uh, um, there's nothing about simultaneous. After example. the last book, I, after the, after the practice book came out, I said, um, that was it. I was done. I'd written everything I knew and I promised I wouldn't write another book. And, and uh, a colleague it regularly reminds me that I have since written another book. Um, I think now... It, I think Jonathan can relate properly. I think, it, it, I mean, I, I'd like to think, um, on the one hand, that I don't have to go through that again. Yeah. Um, Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> in, in theory, um, in theory, um, a book about simultaneous would be fantastic, but I, I don't think... Um, I don't know... My, I've always written books to fill gaps in the market. Mm -hmm. So the, the very first thing I did was just a little collection of exercises because I was teaching in Poland and I didn't have any exercises to use in class. And so the university uh, press helped me publish this first little book. And then I wanted to teach Rosan's uh, La Prise de Note. Yeah. And I realized that the my classic. students didn't have French. Yeah. And so I translated it into English and it was published by the university press again. So it was a gap in the market. And I don't think that there's a gap in the market for a, me to do a simultaneous book now because Seton and Darren's book is, um, is pretty brilliant. Um, and I'm not interested in competing. I, I've always just tried to, I mean, even the consecutive book, uh, it, it's still the only book that's only about consecutive and about the whole of consecutive. There are now quite a few books about note-taking, but there were never very many. I mean, when I wrote the book about note-taking, Roseanne was out of print. Roseanne was out of print, and there weren't many books about note-taking since there have been there have been a few. Well, there's um, much is like, but that's like two big tomes. But it's not really, <laughs> yeah, it's not really for public consumption. No. It's a PhD. No. Um, yeah. And the consecutive book was was to fill a gap in the market. There's a bit, of, there's a, there's an overlap obviously now with the, the Set and Darren book, which came out at about the same time as I was writing and, and finishing off the consecutive book. Um, it'd be fascinating to try and do a simultaneous book, but um, I'm going to try not to. Not just now. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I remember um, reading the review that you wrote of my book, NIEC, and you said something like it, it was the first CPD book for practicing interpreters and I think that that market is actually very underserved um to say the least I mean your book is still the only I mean there's no there, there are now two I think there's yeah. one there's a book on voice coaching and there's your book um and that's not a lot for a constituency of say 10,000 people around the world uh, yeah, uh, at a and, and I think there, there's a market there. I think we've we seem to have gone past the days when interpreters weren't prepared to admit to their own shortcomings. And and you know, if you, I remember, I did a, an early job in my career, and and I was like, you know, asking for feedback from my booth mate, and their feedback was, if you weren't good enough, you wouldn't be here. Not very helpful yeah. feedback, but you know, that kind of that market for CPD and for helping already established interpreters to deal with the issues, like if you're in a market like. 
interpreting in Scotland, the likelihood is you can go three to six months or even a year between jobs. There's not anything set in stone that says, you know, how best to use your time between assignments, because, you know, on the French and German market, your time between assignments, you have time to have a cup of coffee. But I think the, 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 the thing is, one, one thing is that is reading a book the way to get better at interpreting. Um, and I, Eve, whether you're a student or a, a practicing interpreter, th- th- probably you need to interpret and sit down either on your own and listen to that interpreting and work out what you can improve on or sit down with someone else yeah. and work out yeah. what you can improve. And so, yeah, I mean, a book can point you in the right direction about what you might like to listen for, but um, it wouldn't necessarily need to be a very thin book and there would be an awful lot of practice hours in between each uh it wouldn't necessarily need to be a very thick book, sorry. It would be a thin book. And there would be a lot of practice hours in there's between There's much each. more to it than just reading it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it, it, there's, there's much more practice than theory. And therefore, that may go some way to explaining why there aren't more books. Um, but having said that, I mean, Jonathan's right. There's probably still room for uh, for a few. One or two more. Um, not I, I, for I'm me. Su- I'm I, surprised how few interpreters... Um, would Read be books. happy to talk. Would be talk. <laughs> well, would be happy to talk about practice. And then, um, recently, having worked with coaching some interpreters, how few resources there are for anyone who either wants pointers to things to look at in their own interpreting, and or wants to work with kind of coaching, mentoring someone else. There isn't really a book that says, you know, here are I don't know. Um, kind of pulling all these exercises together and all this cumulative teaching knowledge together for people who may find gaps between assignments and say, well, you know, I know I want to work on my interpreting, but where should I look and and what signs should I look out for that I need to work on this or that? There's an awful lot of teaching expertise that could go into kind of like a, almost like a self-coaching or a coaching manual for interpreters to help us grow grow together. Yeah, I mean, mentoring's... uh an interesting one because you can start to see private companies setting up offering uh, continued professional development for interpreters and there there are a few of them around now but I mean in theory it should be extremely expensive because if you want someone to coach you to get better then they've got to be a very good interpreter themselves which would mean they were getting enough interpreting work which would mean in order to give up interpreting work to coach somebody they would have to be extremely expensive. Um, there, there are, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to plug individuals, but I mean, you have uh, ECPD for interpreters mm-hmm. offering online courses. It's more for translators, but they have some stuff. They have some stuff too, for interpreters. Yeah. I mean, Alex offers the occasional webinar. There's um, uh, Sophie Llewellyn-Smith running the Interpreting Coach in the UK, uh, offering courses for, for professional interpreters. I think the... the you know, the, the money is is uh, maybe going to hamper that market from developing particularly because people will still earn more money interpreting. It, so yeah, why that's teach? Issue. I, I think what's more interesting is um, the, uh, the the practice communities that are now being set up by the young younger generation of interpreters. And I mean, and in interpreting is a beautiful job where you remain young until at least the age of forty. Yeah. So anyone under forty at is least young. At anyone least. under forty is young, um, <laughs> and. You have in Paris and in Brussels uh, and in Toronto and in Madrid, at least that I know of, groups of young interpreters who are either graduates from postgraduate conference interpreting courses and or recently accredited interpreters yep. getting together on a regular basis to practice and give feedback to each other. And that is a brilliant development. Um, yeah. And I hope that it sort of snowballs into something bigger and that it becomes the norm to um to practice like that i think um it, interpreters have of, often sort of got together where oh look i've got a consecutive assignment uh, assignments i haven't done any consecutive for a while yeah, can to- we sit down <laughs> and and do some consecutive together absolutely um but it's been very ad hoc and yeah. and it's uh, not terribly structured so these practice communities are a great idea and i hope that um that they they develop and, and become the norm yeah we're also very excited about this and then also other initiatives sort of related to this like interpret time bank where you can sort of schedule you know time with someone to give to give you feedback and i think on top of 
quote unquote simply providing the opportunity to practice i think it also sort of hopefully leads to a change in mentality where we're sort of more aware of the usefulness of cpd and and continuous training and not just say okay well i have my degree and that's it and i'll just go go and work and it'll it'll be fine so um i, th I think that's something to look forward to um Thank you, Andy, for joining you. us. Uh, I, I actually, we have lots of topics that we probably would like to get to, but <laughs> time is limited. But maybe we, we can have you back at some point because we could yeah. talk about topics like, I'm you know, sure the role good. of associations in training and CPD and, and stuff like that. But maybe we can do that um, another day. But for tonight, thank you for joining us thank and you. for all the interesting stuff you had to say, Jonathan. That was, that was great fun. That was that was a really good episode. Alex G will be sad he missed out on that. <laughs> Absolutely, he will be. <laughs>